Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever it is that you are watching this. This is your first stationary stop on the way to the Life and Mapping Mindsets online training. Today, we're going to be covering really some of the biggest challenges that we face being human and within the environment that we currently find ourselves in. These challenges will mainly be focused on the health domain. So join me as we go through Beyond Boundaries, Life Prints Decoding the Human Operating System. So 98% of people, as we have it, don't really know how to control the human operating system. Those 90% are literally waiting and wait for things to break down before they start to figure it all out. And so what typically happens is that we don't actually really know what it is that we need in order for us to feel fulfilled and valued and take advantage of our human operating systems. In fact, what we'll look at, and the car is a beautiful metaphor for the human operating system. It has an engine very similar to our brain that coordinates all the different parts. It has an accelerator and a gas pedal um, in terms of accelerator and gas and a brake pedal, right? So the, that accelerator and that gas and then literally driving forward, driving back. Um, and so we can really look at that in terms of the the heart, how, the, how, how it really pumps all of this through in, in order to drive the vehicle, okay? Uh, now, some people basically um, are looking at their cars and they're admiring their cars, but they're not really driving their cars. Um, because a car is absolutely beautiful to look at, um, depending on what car it is. Uh, however, it's, doesn't work unless it has what? And that's fuel. It can't go, it's just something pretty to look at unless it has fuel. And then the car can go from A to B. Now, typically what happens is people are literally going to the gas station to fill their cars up. And so what happens is it's very similar to people looking to environmental causes to fill them up. They basically other people's opinions, recognition, belonging, acknowledgement, whatever it is, they rely on other people, other events, situations, circumstances to help them feel full or fulfilled. The 1% have worked out how to be the garage and the petrol station. And so other people are going to them to feel full or to feel fulfilled, right? Or to get their fuel, they're relying on an external environmental source. The 1% have worked out how to be that petrol station and are filling other people up. The other 1% have worked out how, and are helping people to become their own petrol stations. And for me, this is true empowerment because it's actually really giving you the knowledge and the tools for you to apply where you become a generator of your own experience instead of an environmental reactor re reacting to the environment and holding the environment responsible for how you feel. And so typically what happens is we're going to show you exactly why it is that this has come about and how we can offer a new solution moving forward. So as we look at it, like I said, we're gonna really be focusing on the domain of health because this is the domain right now where I feel is the biggest challenge and it's a very personal story and experience for me. The current accepted model within the healthcare industry at the moment is based on a behavior or symptom focused treatment. This typically looks like um, changing, modifying or suppressing um, the behavior or symptoms through treatment or prescribing. Okay. 
And what's ended up happening is we've started to actually demonize um, a lot of our natural protective mindset and behavior and how we really function and operate. And because of this um, model, we've inherited it as true. And so for many of us, um, it's typically just um, a bad evaluation model that we're looking at and it's not really informing us in terms of well why is it there in the first place and so for me we need to really have a look at where we stand right now and so if we look at 2019 um, as it stands within the united states and i've used a western model because this is actually very close to a european model and and pretty much a worldwide model wherever i look the stats were staggering um, but I'm going to use 2019 within the United States. I'm only going to look at children for now, at the teenagers from 0 to 17. Okay, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, the website and the link is up there if you want to go check these stats. <clears throat> but this is the state of affairs where we're at right now. ADHD drugs, 0 to 17 year olds, are 3. Point, almost 4 million people. Antidepressants within that age group, 2.1 million. Antipsychotics in that age group, 1 million. Anti-anxiety drugs, 1.3 million. Mood stabilizers, nearly 880,000. And then we've got this new generation of psychotherapeutics, which is another 750,000. This is a total of 9.5 million kids but let's take it a little bit further. Let's have a look at 2019 from the whole in the United States. ADHD drugs, 9.6 million. Antidepressants, 44.2 million. Antipsychotics, 11.6 million. Anti-anxiety drugs, 32.1 million. Newer generation drugs, 1.1 million. It's a total of 123 million people. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to really realize that these stats are moving in the wrong direction. Uh, if you take it back 10 years, they're not, uh, these are not lower. <laughs> um, the, it's, it's, it's frightening to see how these are actually, um, these stats are increasing. Now, let's take a look at what happens when we look at this model within a corporate context. We're gonna take a look at a document um, and some stats published by the World Health Organization. Cost to company within the mental health uh, sphere um, taken May, 2019. Um, key facts that came out of this was workers good for mental health, but negative working environments lead to a lot of physical and mental health problems. Depression and anxiety have a significant economic impact. The estimated cost to the global economy at the moment is about one trillion US dollars loss in productivity. Harassment, bullying um, are common areas within leadership and within the workforce um, and are always reported to HR in terms of problems. This is a substantial amount of impact on mental health from bullying, whether it be emotional or physical at work um, or even manipulative, okay? <clears throat> So there are many effective actions that organizations can take in terms of this um, to promote mental health in the workspace. And what they found for, was for every $1 scaled up treatment uh, for the common uh, mental disorders, there's a return of $4 back in improved health and productivity. So it doesn't take a genius to understand that taking care of your employees or your team or your leadership um, has a significant impact in terms of the ROI and cost to company. Um, so for any leadership team, any empathic executive that is focused on increasing engagement um, and really looking after their team, or whether it's somebody, whether one of you are literally looking at this in terms of upskilling yourself within the business, creating yourself and uh, making yourself a linchpin in terms of being able to provide deep trust and relationship building connections. So as we can see that this is one of the biggest domains in terms of understanding human functioning, 
um, that really needs to be addressed because the model at the moment is madness. Okay, and so how do we get here and what can we do? And I truly believe the younger we start, the better. Because when I was younger, I was born in 1979. I grew up um, with two mothers. I was born in apartheid South Africa and um, up until the age of seven, I spoke fluent Zulu until I was basically went to school and it was indoctrinated out of me. It was an incredible time of separation. Now, as a young child, uh, you can see my, my mom in the background there, my, my African mom, both of my parents worked. And so she looked after me during the day, but I didn't know any better. And I saw her as my mother. She used to carry me on her back. She used to sing Zulu songs to me. I admired her. I adored her. She was just the best. I used to play at the playground. She used to take me. She used to change my dirty nappies. She literally did everything for me. And so I grew up very fortunate with two moms, as I saw it. Um, I was a bit of a sensitive child. I used to love dressing up in my sister's tutu. Um, and South Africa wasn't really a place for sensitive children at that time. And I remember my dad coming home and kind of looking at this child giggling and running around and doing twirls in, in the lounge. And I caught his eyes and I was so happy and gleeful. And I saw this kind of stern crossed look. Um, nevertheless, we never saw that tutu again. Um, and as I developed, um, as I grew closer, and as I started to develop a, an identity, I remember being invited uh, to a birthday party, friends of my parents' friends. I was a, a little bit older, they were younger, I think it was about seven or, or eight um, in this picture here. And I dressed up as, there was a series called Noddy and Noddy and Big Ears, and then they were the Gollywogs. And so, I wanted to dress as a gollywog. I, I, I really, you know, that I, I'd, I wanted to be close. I was always being found trying to paint my, my skin or my face. I used to take my mom's lipstick and try and paint my face because I was very confused. I didn't know why I had different colored skin if this was my mom and it was all over. So I dressed up as this gollywog. And it was the first real time and, or second time because of the tutu was the first really, but the second time where I felt that I wasn't really in control. Um, the environment was more kind of moving me about because as I walked into this dress up birthday party, the kids scattered like nightmare on Elm Street, um, tears and crying and they were terrified. Um, and so for the entire birthday party, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere near them. They were terrified of me. Um, I had to stay in a separate room um, until my parents were ready to go. And so I was started to see that there was this very distinct separation within the environment. Um, by that time, being a sensitive kid, my parents thought it would be healthy for me to go to boarding school and toughen up. Um, and it's amazing what you can basically hide behind a smile. Um, I remember my dad dropping me off and saying, if you think you're going to get expelled from the school, Justin, I'm going to take you to Boys Town, which was like a reformatory school for boys with bars in the windows and stuff. And I distinctly remember him because of my um, resilience. I was always such a resilient kid, very independent. Um, and in a conservative environment, that's not really... <clears throat> Um, such a good thing for kids when the belief system at the time and, and the cultural acceptance is children should be seen and not heard. And so I was always very outspoken. I was considered ex exceptionally obnoxious. And I started to develop a bit of a resentment towards society and systems. Um, and so when I got to boarding school, being probably the most restrictive uh, place I could go, um, I started to look for ways to rebel um, and kind of escape that routine. Um, and so rebelling against that routine and moving forward, we found um, a place underneath the chapel where we could escape. We started doing things that we shouldn't have been doing and we were caught and I eventually got expelled from the school. Um, that progressed further when I started to explore other avenues within my life um, and I came up against more systems and more resistance. One of them was to study energy and study energy systems and, and things like Reiki and as a 13 year old 
14 year old boy, this was very strange in this conservative environment. And I got accused of witchcraft and all of this, and then getting involved in art was just, just horrendous. And so the spiral, I started to rebel even more and intensify that. And eventually I was taken from psychologist to psychiatrist, what's wrong with this child and all of this stuff. And I started to get dosed on medication. I started to get so numb. I used to carry around a little pill box in my pocket. I had to take tablets every single day. And I was told that I was manic depressant bipolar um, and um, anti-authoritative. And so that started a journey that was really completely numbing. And the only thing that I could really do to, to get in touch with my feelings again was literally swallow MDMA um, like they were smarties. And so I developed um, uh, basically a habit where we were going out every single night at 15, 16, once I'd been expelled with my best friend and we started exploring club culture and getting away with things that we shouldn't really do. And so I ended up things separating within the family so much that I turned my back on my family and I left. Um, I went overseas to London that ended very, very traumatically. Um, I ended up being attacked in a bar in London and the I was working in, in, in a place in Vauxhall and this patron had too much to drink and I told him he had to leave and we were going to get him a cab home, but I couldn't get to the cab because someone was using the phone upstairs and if someone's using the phone upstairs, you can't use it downstairs and he didn't understand that. And so I said, look, just finish your drink and out with you. Um, and he said, yeah, I'll finish my drink. All right. And he takes a big swig and then thrusts it towards my face. And I managed to get my arm up and the beard loss shattered on my arm, cutting through three tendons, my ulnar nerve and my radial artery. And I knew I was in trouble when I saw it. I remember it was so surreal. It was like, oh, and it, I was reminded of the sprinklers um, during sport when they water the fields and it, and it does this ch -ch 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 -ch. And I was like, oh, it looks like that in this, the, because the blood was leaking and it was basically shooting as my heart pumped. And I remember like, oh, I'm painting the ceiling. And it was just, fortunately there was a nurse that was drinking at the, at the bar with her husband. She grabbed her husband's tie, ripped it off his, his neck, jumped over the bar and tourniqueted my arm and put it up. Um, I then literally ended up um, regurgitating my entire stomach and then passed out and I, um, had an experience, a near-death experience, where I was met um, with an incredible amount of information. And I basically got to see my life in review, which was the amount of disappointment that I felt in terms of the things that I'd done. I'd lived very dangerously, I'd lived very extremely, and I just really had no um, respect for life. I was just living at full tilt um, and, and really sucking up as much as I could, but with no real purpose or no real anchoring or grounding to anything that was at all beneficial for me. And so I remember getting this whole review and being told you've got two choices. You can walk these two paths. This path will end in a very early life and a death where um, it'll be a hell of a lot of fun, but there's nothing that you'll be remembered for or do um, and you'll have to come back and do it all again from ground zero. Or you can go back to what you were doing when you started. And I was like, okay, well, what was that? There's a few things. And you'll live a long life um, and you'll do things that are very beneficial for people um, and that will, will remain. And I was like, well, um, eventually I, this, I, I came back and realized that, okay, well, clearly I've done this other path for way so long. Um, there's not much more I can really experience down that journey. Let me shift gear. And it took me, um, the, medic, the medical team told me that there was a 50% chance I'd get the use of my right arm back. I'd, I'm incredibly resilient and stubborn and that wasn't good enough for me. Um, and so I set up along a path of rehabilitation, which is where I got into integrative health care, um, studied consciousness-based medicine, studied Eastern philosophy, studied uh, Western physiology and anatomy, studied um, functional movement science, and then kind of graduated and started my own rehabilitation track. 
And from that rehabilitation track, I managed to basically um, rehabilitate my hand to about 90% now. Um, I've basically gone on, progressed and, and learned a lot of qualifications, learned a lot of me methodologies um, and really delved deeply into consciousness based behavior and how physics, um, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, unified physics, how it all basically comes together within a biological um, from a structural, functional and energetic perspective. Um, and so I started to build a practice and I had a practice for a while. I had a confirmation um, and I'd promised myself that I'd never leave Cape Town and I would never, ever, ever get married. Um, and that, well, I know that nothing is ever made in stone and nothing is ever set in stone. And so I made an agreement. I said to the universal creator, I said, basically, I don't want to get married. I don't want to leave Cape Town. This is it's the first place that I really felt like I belonged in South Africa. I always felt like an outsider. I didn't feel, feel like I belonged on this planet at all. And so I said, but if it is by your design, then she will propose to me. And then I'll take it that this is destiny and this is a path that I need to walk. And so I thought, yes, no woman on their right mind would ever propose to me. Boy, was I wrong. And so I met my wife, Jacqueline. Um, and she proposed in a little Italian restaurant in Cape Town. Um, and we literally packed up our lives and um, moved to Switzerland. And so I left Cape Town and I got married. Um, and that set upon a journey of um, really starting to create my own system. Um, so the area that we stayed in in Switzerland was actually an area that Jung and Freud had both of them had clinics here. Um, and so that was really about the time that I was deeply immersed in quantum mechanics and unified physics and really looking for uh, mentors and practitioners that were getting often miraculous results consistently, but were challenging the Cartesian model. And I'd received so much benefit, and I just had to follow this train of thought and this thinking. Um, I studied with, with many mentors and then went on and kind of looked at all of this. And there were often very many missing pieces within the puzzle because each one was looking at it through um, a lens until I found Nassim Haramein, <clears throat> who really had him and Ken Wilber had this beautiful approach of an integral theory where everything is interconnected. Um, and we're all part of this uh, resonance and this development. Um, <clears throat> from there, I really started to apply this within a model. And what I found when we started to doing the research and the practice was this was starting to reach over 90% uh, success rates. When we started to apply it within principles of biological systems and actually started to apply it from a practitioner energetic medicine side, the results seem to amplify because we're using a specific detail. Um, and so, that kind of started the journey and I became a contributing member at the Resonance Science Academy, um, part of their first pilot program for their online launch of Unified Physics. And I was invited to the launch of the Connected Universe um, and finally got to meet uh, a mentor and someone whose physics and Unified Physics and um, patterns of unification this entire system is based on. Um, and that's Nassim Haramein. And so I got to spend some time with him at the launch at the BAFTAs in London. We had dinner and we got to really exchange some, some wonderful ideas. But the biggest challenge that I found was all of this passion and all of this, this momentum that I had and the results that were coming didn't really help me in terms of business. I didn't, still didn't know what I was doing in terms of business. And so I ended up finding mentors that knew way more than I did. Um, but I didn't necessarily always get on with them. Um, but they had an incredible influence on my life. And so never ever let personality get in the way of your progress. Um, because some people have an incredible amount of value to offer and they may be able to help you, but they may not be 
um, the, the perfect person um, in terms of their personality or what they, they stand for. Doesn't mean that you need to join their network for a long time, but they have information in terms of helping you to progress. And often that uncomfortability, that uncertainty is necessary in order for you to grow and evolve and be able to deal with some really real conversations, the real tough ones. Um, and because of that, because of staying with that, um, often I've had mentors that our personalities don't match, um, and, but it never gets in the way of progress. And so being showing humility and being humble enough to know, okay, um, I'm in the student position here, um, and just because I don't agree with some of the personal traits of this person or belief systems, it doesn't mean that there is no value for me here. And so from the systems that I learned from some incredible mentors, I started to really work at a top, a, a higher end in terms of my clientele, um, working with Champions League and uh, Swiss national football stars to world press uh, photograph journalist winners, um, photographic journalism, um, and everybody in between. And the results have just started to like just gone from strength to strength to strength. It's really, really astounding. Um, and so that's led me to where I am now, where we're traveling um, internationally and we allowing people to learn the life print OS decoding the human operating system um, because it's hugely valuable. Um, and it offers a solution to the very big challenges that we're having right now in terms of the healthcare model because we're in trouble. Um, and just like me having to almost end my life because I was so numb and so out of it and so completely loose, um, we need to kind of come to a resolution here in terms of a different way because we're so far down the track. If we continue along this track, I just, there is such huge concern for, for the generation that's coming. Um, and so how did we get here? Well, for me, I really truly believe it starts within nine to nine years where it's an intellectual learning process. And this is where we start to inherit a lot of our parental conditioning, our cultural conditioning, our environmental conditioning. We don't know right and wrong yet. And so this is this kind of like a sponge. And so from nine to nine and nine to 18 is firstly the internal collective of our tribe, our parents kind of really pushing um, what it is that they need in order for us to get that love and attention. And then nine to 18 is where we kind of move out into more of a system and we get kind of um, initiated or inducted into the educational system. And that continues on um, for some from 18 to 27, some even longer. Uh, but those systemizations. And now from those two, we're just going to go through the challenges right now. What happens is a lot of the innate natural behaviors that we have, drivers that we have, um, don't fit the model or the system that we're in. And so the societal expectation, the parental inheritances, uh, cultural inheritances, I'll give you an example for a child that's very extroverted um, naturally and has this huge gift to be able to share information and, and gather information as born into a Swiss culture. And that is not desired because we are not extroverted, we're introverted. Um, well, not me in terms of Swiss culture, right? And so because of that, that conditioning then gets conditioned out um, where it was a natural um, healthy behavior. And so we look at typically things like this, specifically in terms of what do we need to do in order to get that attention, get that connection um, and feel like we belong to this tribe. And so often there's a lot of conditioning not to be me, not to be naturally me. What also happens is this is a very stressful time. It's never really the children, it's the parents that are stressed. Um, and often ADHD the, or ADD is really just stress uh, because the, the child can't run anywhere because they're in a closed classroom or they're at home. They can't run away because who's going to provide for them? They know they can't do that. 
Uh, some definitely do try, they come back very quickly um, until the teenagers where they're more successful, but uh, not to nine, it, it does happen. Um, the second thing is they can't fight you. So because they're bigger, they, they know they don't stand a chance. So the only thing that they can really do is freeze or faint. And uh, that freeze motion is really where they take their brain because they're so stressed and they disassociate and they go somewhere else. And that's why they get this daydreaming because they're stressed. They can't really deal. They need to have a shift or a change or, or ground or, or burn that energy. Um, and so what happens is this response has been misinterpreted. And so a lot of children are actually dosed because they're stressed. Um, and they're only stressed because the environment's stressed. Um, and so a lot of the natural behaviors start to develop here. And we start to develop these stories in terms of what's right, what's wrong, what's required, what's necessary, what I should, what I shouldn't do. And all of this is set up from an outside in model. Now, remember this, where somebody else is telling us what is acceptable. We then kind of go into a system um, that says, well, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. So we're only evaluating and we're saying all humans need to be Ferraris. But some people aren't driving Ferraris. Some people are driving minibuses. Some people are driving RVs. Some people are driving four by fours. Some people are driving limousines. Some people are driving all sorts of different cars, but we're expecting everybody to be able to do the same things. This is madness, okay? And so what happens is when you evaluate it only on one level, you feel as if, if you don't have any of that um, performance potential, you're gonna think you're stupid. And so this continues. And so we start developing more and more built, uh, filters and more and more belief systems in terms of what we can do. And so what we need right now is there's no point in pointing out and throwing stones, but, and to, to break a system, trust me, I've tried my entire life and it hasn't done me any, any good. What we can do is what uh, Buckminster Fuller said, Buckminster Fuller, as he said, don't fight the old, create a new model that makes the old one obsolete instead of fighting the old. So to break the mold, create the new, All right? And so this is really what LifePrint has to offer. And so we really look at, well, what is reality? It's contrasted duality. And so this means that for every point, there's an opposite and equal other point, okay? And we can go through this in terms of hot, cold, bittersweet, positive, negative, strong, weak. There's always a polar opposite to that experience. We can go on forever, okay? But this is what really gives rise to conflict in our life is because we're attached to these specific belief systems that we have. And what happens is when the environment where our everyday life contrasts that to us, it causes this conflict and goes through our mind, okay? And so what we look at here is we view energy in the same light, okay? Is we're looking here at what gives rise to these belief systems, but because we are also part of nature, right? What we're looking at here is getting closer to a natural response system. And so even though we are experiencing this contrasted reality, it's a natural phenomenon that comes up. There's nothing absolutely wrong with it. And so when we look um, at energy and contrasted belief system, we're moving away from right and wrong, positive and negative, and we're looking at things of natural systems. And so if a volcano explodes, for instance, we don't look at the volcano and go, oh, bad volcano, naughty volcano. No, what we look at is we're going, oh, okay, it's reacted, it spewed lava everywhere, but it's natural. We don't go, we need to now destroy the volcano, okay? Um, very 
the same thing with our mindsets. We don't want to kind of go, oh, that's a positive or a negative. We want to look at things in terms of, okay, that's a growth potential or that's a protective potential. Is this person moving and expanding? Are they open uh, or are they moving back? Are they contracting? Are they protecting themselves? Both are completely normal. Yet what we have done is we've demonized the protective mindset. And so it's the same thing as, as really um, taking that protective mindset and ignoring it and saying, oh, that's unwanted, we don't want that, it's all of that. And what we do is we add density and pressure and it keeps building up. And so within this contrasted duality, we wanna get away from very charged words. There's a lot of language patterns out there that brings a lot of this conflict in like, oh, don't be so reactive or, um, there's a lot of charge language patterns within the life print operating system. We get away from those charges and we look at our mindset in terms of two pathways, either a growth mindset or protective mindset. And both are completely natural for you to experience within this contrasted duality that we call our reality. And so when we look and we break down the structure and how this works within a biological human system, we're going to look at that contrast in terms of masculine energy or feminine energy. I like to use the Chinese um, verbiage for this in terms of yang and yin because it's not too charged. Even masculine and feminine these days have a tendency to be, people always go to gender. It's very important very, very important that we get away from gender when we look at evaluation models of performance potential, okay? And so we're gonna look at a left brain versus a right brain, the contrast of that. And so when we're evaluating performance specifically, it is of paramount importance that we disregard gender. Gender will only really come into the analysis when we're looking at the decade influence and the belief systems that may be interfering with this person's enhancements, evolution and development. And so <clears throat> this masculine, um, feminine, yin, yang, left brain, right brain is non-gender specific. We're just looking at, at understanding how the brain functions to convey certain concepts. So the left brain would be more of the masculine energy. It's more instinctual, okay? It's dominant, it's assertive, it's like logic, it's like systematic, it's very goal oriented and loves order, okay? The contrast to that would be a right brain function, which is more feminine energy. It likes enhancing, it's creative, it's intuitive, it's empathic, um, it's sensitive, conceptual, and chaotic. All right. And so those are the two contrasts that we look in terms of how our brains function. Uh, within that functioning, it is also possible to get what we call a harmonized brain, which means that it functions right and left brain together in a harmonized um, capacity. And so both of these pathways are completely natural. One is a growth mindset. One is a protective mindset. This is very similar to swimming up and down a stream. So if you're in a protective mindset, you're in that contracted state, you're trying to, you're trying to protect yourself. And so it's almost life has the experience of um, kind of moving against you. It's, it's, it's restrictive, you swimming upstream, it feels like it's always hard. Um, whereas the flip side, the growth mindset is almost like you're lying on your lila, going down the stream, having a nice sip on your cocktail, enjoying the lovely sun and the friends around you. Opportunities are always around, doors are opening, people want to gravitate to you because you're so um, full of life that they want to spend time around you and it almost feels like life is now happening for you and you're in the stream. And then there's another part where some people are not even in the stream, but they still want to protect the mindsets and they're watching others in the stream. They're not even participating. They're kind of looking at their Ferraris or their beautiful cars in the garage and they're like, oh, this is nice, but they never really get into it and use it to its full potential, right? Because they're in a protective state and they don't even want to get in the water. Okay. And so those kind of the patterns that I start to see within everybody's um, environment after doing this uh, for <clears throat> 15 years now, uh, I've started to notice that those 98% of people are environmental reactors. They're looking for situations, events, 
other people's opinions, um, all of these things to fill them up. They're taking their vehicles to the petrol station and making other people responsible for how they feel or what happens in their life. And therefore they have no control or power because everybody else is sitting with the fuel. What this is doing is we really wanna turn this around and, and polarize this so that you become the petrol station. You are generating your own fuel. You are the one that is in full control of your human operating system and you know exactly how to um, recode, reprogram, and rewire your brain to take advantage of the potential that you're sitting with. And so we don't always get what we want, and yet we almost always get what we need. What do we mean by this? To understand your human operating system, you've got to understand what your fuel is. You've then got to understand, now that you know what fuels your human operating system, you've got to understand what human operating system you have because not everybody has a Ferrari. So you've got to find out what is your performance profile? What is um, your mindset all about? How does this all come together? Because nobody has ever really given you these tools. And so we've got a very, very mad model that we're looking at and it's not really designed for an integral way of living. And so our human needs are really what drive all of our behavior. Most people are really starting to look at emotions quite a lot right now, but where do emotions come from? We've got to go back to the root source. What's the fuel? The emotion is the heart that drives that car. Am I putting it on the accelerator? Am I literally putting the brakes on? Am I driving into oncoming traffic in a protective mindset? Am I in a growth mindset? And I'm literally on this, this huge open way highway and it's great and it's slipstream and there's no traffic whatsoever. The hood's down and I'm loving life, okay? And so what is it that gets that emotion and that behavior and that's our needs? And so depending on your personal profile, uh, your personal performance profile and analysis, there will be specific needs that will play a high priority for you. However, um, we want them all fulfilled, okay, in order to feel like we're really winning. And so if you don't understand the rules of life, it almost becomes impossible to win. Imagine getting on a tennis court and not understanding the rules against somebody who does. Your chances of winning um, drop drastically. Okay, and so this is the rules in terms of how you win to generate your own fuel to control your entire experience and flip into that frictionless flow where it all can go, right? And the world opens up for you. And so let's meet these needs and let's set the rules of the game of life. The first need is certainty or security. We all need a sense of certainty. I need to know that I'm gonna sitting here with you, this roof isn't gonna collapse on my head. I need to be certain of that. I need to know when I go to the tap, there's gonna be running water or when I go to the toilet, it's gonna to flush, okay? Um, I need to know when I turn the lights on, the electricity is gonna work and I have a warm bed. That gives me security, it gives me certainty, okay? However, if there's too much certainty, Okay, there's a protective side too. That's the growth side. Okay, and so if there's too much certainty, I become bored. It's rep life's repetitive. There's inertia. I don't want to. This is too. This is lovely. I've got all this home. The security is great. I don't want to um, move anywhere. This is too comfortable. And so life gets a little bit inertic. The second need is variety to offset that certainty or a little bit of adventure where in the growth state it's exciting there's adventure there's the surprise and mystery to life the challenge on the protective side is sometimes i look towards amoral behavior because i'm bored i choose drugs i drink i go look for unhealthy connections um, and there's insecurity and danger and fear okay and so moving between those two points we then look at significance. Some people use very different vehicles in order to achieve these needs. Some people get tattoos to feel significant or get piercings. Some people carry guns and feel more powerful when they put it to somebody's head. But we all want to feel significant to our community, to our partner, to our peers, and to our family. We do this in a growth set. We're generating that and we're helping to feel that 
uh, admiration and that attention, okay? But it's helping us to feel more important and more unique. We wanna be special. The protective mindset of that is we can get arrogant, obnoxious, egotistical, and we can become rude and complete, complete ignorance. And so there's always these two flow sets. Just be aware of this. We can get them in a health, in, in, in a beneficial way or something that is a little bit more detrimental. And so within the fourth need, we find this connection, this love and belonging, and it really builds up because only through connection can you experience love, whether that's to yourself or to another. Um, that develops into love. And when you experience love, it doesn't matter what you do, but this person will still love you and therefore you belong. You feel the sense of belonging that no matter what you do, you, you will still be included. And so this brings harmony, inclusion, security, that comfort, that love and that joy that is experienced. But the protective mindset from this, if you don't think you can be manipulated through love, you're wrong. Repressed through love, you're wrong. Depressed, judged or abused. That's the protective mindset within that pull. The love is then becomes conditional um, and manipulation plays out through that. The fifth human operating system need is the need to develop, to grow. And in fact, that's how happiness is. Literally suffering is, the definition of suffering is literally killing yourself to find happiness, not knowing what it is. Okay, so not knowing what happiness is and killing yourself to get there is the pure definition of suffering. Okay, when you understand what happiness is and you have a, a track to get there, suffering is eliminated because you know exactly what it is that's going to fulfill you and you're in that frictionless flow within that growth mindset. And because you're challenging yourself, those challenges are helping you to grow. And because you're growing, you're progressing. And because you're progressing, you're getting better and you're happier and a happier person. People that progress are naturally happier. Okay, no one wants to drink from a stagnant pool of water. So challenges and growth are a human need that is necessary. The sixth one is harmony. We wanna have harmony, tranquility, have a peaceful life and being able to find peace. Uh, this is really, how we achieve that frictionless flow of fulfillment. And so the seventh is independence and freedom. Two similar, very different independence-like structure. Freedom doesn't, but they're both necessary. And so they kind of go together. Um, and so this is kind of how we express ourselves. Freedom is the ability just to move um, wherever we want. Doesn't necessarily need a structure. Independence wants to be independent of the structure, but also be able to come back to it too. Um, doesn't want to feel codependent. Okay. Um, and so we look at that in terms of a high driving human need. The eighth driving human need is really the mastery of self. Okay. All over an activity or a way of doing things. And so I've never met a single person that is not on a path of mastery in one form or another. And so mastery of self or mastery over an activity or skill um, is one that is highly valued and desired within all operating systems, even whether it's kind of making pancakes on the side of the street, okay? Living on the streets is another mastery. I've met people that are masters at living on the street when I was homeless in Berlin unbelievable. I was shown how to gather food, where to sleep. Um, it was an incredible experience, but these people were masters at surviving on the street. Um, we then move into the last human need, which is contribution or higher purpose. Uh, this is how you really win. This brings so much meaning to your life is your ability to be able to contribute, contribute and give back. Um, reach new milestones and be able to leave a legacy. So contribution and higher purpose connects you to something greater than yourself um, and also goes very strongly with belonging. Um, but if you can link yourself to a higher purpose that is without the belonging, it is even more powerful. Okay. And so when we look at this, we're looking at those nine driving human needs for all humans, but our valuation model is very different. We look at five categories of performance. Now, most people know about the first two, the system, the educational system really evaluates on that intellectual performance. Um, and if you don't live up to that, you, you have a, you typically labeled, you cast aside, even if you don't 
ascribe to the dogmatic science models in terms of what you're looking at because it's only looking at what you can read, repeat, um, and redo. It's not really looking at the innovative and all the other performance categories. And so we're just gonna start off with the intellectual performance. These people are easily known to express ideas, communicate them effectively, either through gathering information or innovating new solutions or leading. The emotional performance, these people consistently exhibit straight traits like being understanding, team-minded, empathy, serving others, very creative and good in collaborating cohesively with others. The motivational performance are those that are really charming, are good at negotiation, very persuasive, they're the motivators of others and capable of working collaboratively within diverse teams. We then have practical performance, those people who are known to be more resourceful, the workhorses, methodical, um, very compliant within business and are highly valued as those um, practical um, practitioners that get things done. Um, and then we have a transformational category, which really looks at the ability to plug into more intuitive senses that are higher perceptive, not so much emotive, um, but they are incredibly agile minded, quick learners, um, but don't really, a lot of them stay very grounded, but they're very good at future trending and understanding and getting to the real root of problems by passing all the bones and the nerves and the artery. They're very big perceptual abilities. Okay, very often very artistic and very creative. And so we really evaluate on those five categories where we look in terms of a human operating system. It can be intellectual, it can be emotional, it can be motivational, we can be practical, and we can be transformational. We can forgive, we can move on, we can get better and progress. And so we move through these different um, evaluation um, potentials in terms of our performance. And so what happens typically is when we discuss this, the conditioning, our, our, the programming from our parents, the, the um, induction of industry, of the educational system, um, moving into university, moving into workplace, and all of this society's um, pressure in terms of this is what you need to be successful, and all of these things start to develop what we call the reticular activating system, and these filters start to stick, and these stories, and we form these rules and these boundaries and these principles of the world. And now the biggest challenge with that is the brain has to be right. And so whether it's true or not, it will look for the things that will validate its experience. And so what happens is those belief systems from naught to nine, we don't really recall them or revisit them. They become part of our subconscious processing and the brain starts to filter the information to validate our experience of what is true. And so from the parental programming to the institutional induction, to of the educational system, what happens is we get all of these stories and we start to live the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so what happens is not many people understand that the actual emotion comes from the needs. The needs are the energetic drivers of emotion and that has a behavior output which will either be an energetic generator, which is an energy rich emotional experience that has this beautiful growth mindset behavior output, or it'll be an energetic reactor to the environment because it's not getting what it wants from the environment in order to fill it up. And it is an energetically poor experience because it doesn't have control because it's relying on an external system to feed it. And therefore is a protective mindset that is stuck in a contractive state. And so both understand this are very, very normal. The challenge is we've demonized the other side and we're not really understanding why. And when we go deeper into this, we'll discover. The last piece that we really need to understand is if everybody has different vehicles, if we're driving around in different performance vehicles, a lot of people are trying to drive their four by four or their, their RV like a Ferrari because 
they don't know any better because they've adopted, adapted, and something that's different to their natural process. And now um, they are almost fragmenting themselves. And so when we meet people along the path, we've got to kind of meet ourselves first. And so we've got to be able to tolerate our process, the choices we've made, and our overreactive protective mindset. Because only like think about this, if you can't tolerate yourself, then who are you going to tolerate? Right? Who are you going to be able to tolerate if you can't even tolerate yourself? From that tolerance, though, respect starts to develop. Respect for your processes, for your choices, for your overreaction, your protective mindset, because it's there to protect you. It's a natural functioning. That's what got you, the human, into where we are right now, was the ability to adapt and have a protective mindset that kept us safe when there was danger in the environment. There's just not that much danger in the environment anymore. And so we start to respect that there's this growth and this protective mindset, and we need both of it. So we respect that. And when we respect both sides, tolerance and respect, all of that, we eventually fall in love with ourselves because we start to see how valuable each is. And once we do that, once we accept our protective mindset, we can then use that in a growth mindset way. And it's a beautiful thing. And we're going to teach you how to do all of this. When you reach that love for yourself and you can see that and you have that respect and that tolerance for that protective mindset, you then begin to honor other people that also are wired differently. They have different tools. And so you start to honor everybody else's process, their decisions and their protective mindset because they're just doing the best that they possibly can. And when you do that, something beautiful starts to happen because grace starts to open up in your life. And when this happens, the most beautiful environments, the most beautiful people, the grace is the most amazing energy that comes into your life. And love turns into something that's more internal. And you learn to love all people wherever they are within their journey because you're honoring them and you gracefully accepting them for where they are and they're doing the best that they can along their journey, all right? And so those are kind of the foundational principles that we set ourselves in within the LifePrint OS. And we decode the human operating system. We're, not, we're getting away from dogmatic, we're getting away from secular, we're getting more into an integral way where we can start closing the gap and transforming the trauma of the separation, the seemingly separation that we're seeing in our world right now because the collective unconscious unconscious in this very unprecedented time starts to um, bubble up because it starts to clean itself out because it's time to transcend and transform into where we're moving into and it's necessary that all eyes are open that we get to see this collective unconscious and those darkest things to come up so they can move out the system it's almost like a purging that's going on and so all systems are coming up for valuation However, in order to get change, because we want to change all of this programming that may not be helping us to progress, because a lot of it is like coming into this world with a whole bunch of playlists on your phone, on your, um, on your iTunes that you don't even like, a whole bunch of songs that you don't need, and those are redundant right now and we need a way to recode rewire and recalibrate your brain for a growth mindset all of this is necessary in order for us to reach our potential we all want to reach our potential and we all know that progress now is happiness but in order to get this we need to take decisions and we need to make decisions and take action nothing happens because you can't be the same person over there that you are now because otherwise you would already be and you would have already achieved what it is that you wanted to do and so in order to be better to enhance and evolve you're going to have to make decisions and take action okay and part of that taking action is applying what you've learned if you don't apply what you've learned you might as well not have learned it in the first place and it was a complete waste so take 
action and make decisions to do things differently. Okay, and that's the only way you're going to get results is through that level of certainty and those results are going to inform one or two things within you, okay? It's gonna reinforce your belief system, your BS, which is either going to be a beautiful story or it's gonna be your bullshit boundary, okay? It's gonna be the bullshit boundary that's holding you back. And it's either gonna reinforce that or it's going to be your beautiful story. And so I really welcome you. Um, thank you so much. Congratulations in signing up for the LifePrint OS Mapping Mindsets online training. We're kicking things off um, shortly. And I just hope this presentation has given you a bit of a perspective and an overview in terms of what we're finding challenging. And we're going to show you the entire way forward in terms of how we can offer a new solution, a new way of being and doing when it comes to interacting with others, interacting with our own life and really understanding what it is our full spectrum of performance looks like from an individual as well as a collective because we're part and one of the same thing. I hope this has been informative. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I look forward to them and look forward to sharing and connecting more along this journey. We will go much deeper in the three-day training. This is basically just giving you an overview and an altitude of awareness in terms of what it is that we're really trying to achieve within the company. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for your time and I value your feedback. Have a beautiful, beautiful morning, afternoon or evening.